Good morning. Welcome everyone to worship this morning. Um, a few quick announcements before we get started. Um, this morning we will not have Sunday school following worship. Instead, we will have our fellowship luncheon. Um, everybody's welcome, whether you brought something or not. Please uh, stay with us afterwards and have a time of fellowship and food around the table. Um, tonight, no kids group. Wednesday, uh, Bible study at 6 p.m. We will also next Sunday have communion, just so that you're aware. It's also Palm Sunday next Sunday, and the following Sunday is Easter. And so that Saturday, the 8th, we will have an Easter egg hunt at 10 o'clock. Um, volunteers, if you'd love, like to help, please let me know. Um, church yard sale, Saturday, May 13th. Um, also the blessing box, but also, again, Easter morning. Um, if you'd like to bring flowers from home to decorate the cross outside, uh, please do. And uh, one last announcement is not on here. Um, Normally, uh, the week between Palm Sunday and Easter, they are Holy Week services here in town. This year, they are at 12 o'clock at the Divine Savior Catholic Church, if you are interested in that. They normally last about an hour, have a meal. Um, but So if you're able to go, um, they'll be there at the Catholic Church here in town. But that's all the announcements I have for us this morning. So we've come to worship the Lord. Uh, oh, one last thing. If you have a bulletin and it says March 19th, that's the pastor's fault. I forgot to change the date. So if it says Daniel and the Lions, then you have the correct bulletin this morning. Um, pastors are fallible. It's a reminder for everybody that I make mistakes. <laughs> so, um, so this morning we come to, to worship the Lord. And so let's be called to worship from his word from Psalm 92 verses 1 through 3. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody, to the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work, and the works of your hands I sing for joy. Let's pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, we come before you this morning. Lord, what a blessed thing it is to come to your house to worship you together with your people. Lord, you are the mighty God who deserves all the thanksgiving, all of the praise, all of who we are and Lord, this morning we pray that you would help us to tune our hearts to you. Lord, help us to see you in your glory and your majesty. Help us to see who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to honor and glorify you in the way that you deserve. Lord, may you build us up. May you bless us here in this time of worship. Lord, equip us to go out from here today to honor and glorify you in the world. And now, Lord, as we turn to you, to your praises, to your your word, and to you in prayer, Lord, may you bless us, may you be with us, may you equip us and encourage us, all for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. By to stand together, our first hymn is number 141, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my dear Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrow cease, tis music in the sinner's ear. Is life and health and peace. He breaks the power of reigning sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the sinful clean. His blood availed for me. My gracious master and my God, assist me to seated. Our scripture passage this morning will be coming from the book of Daniel chapter 6. We'll read the first portion here with verses 1 through 15. Hear now God's word. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom and over them three high officials of whom Daniel was one to whom these satraps should give account so that the king might suffer no loss. 
Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful, and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction, that whoever makes petition to any god or man for thirty days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber toward, open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, whom he, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. And then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. God's word for God's people. Amen. And let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we come again before you this morning. Lord, we come to you as a God who provides and cares for his people, a God that we know we can rest in. For, Lord, you are the almighty God who is over all things. As we look at our lives, our circumstances may differ. For some of us, life might be going well. For others of us, life, we might be struggling. And there might be those of us here today that are despairing for life is, is such a burden. Yet we are reminded that you are the mighty God that can answer any of our prayers, who does answer them, well, that can do the impossible. And so, Lord, we come this morning and we rest in you. We offer these things that are going on in our lives to you because you are able. Lord, it may be our emotional struggle. We might be struggling with depression, with anxiety. We might be having trouble with our families, our spouse, our children, our parents. Lord, it might be struggles in our schools, with our classmates, with our teachers. It could be in our jobs with our employers, with our fellow employees. Lord, wherever it might be, we come to you know that you are a God that is able to answer wherever and whatever it might be. And so we give these things to you. We know that you are a God that continues to provide for his people. Lord, that continues to care for us in each and every day. And so, Lord, we rest upon you here this morning. So, Lord, as we look at this world, we see the brokenness. We see the violence. We see the hatred. We see the sin. And, Lord, we despair, but we are reminded of the hope we have in Christ Jesus. That this world will one day pass away. And that those that are yours will be with you forever. And Lord, even though we have that hope, Lord, may you help us now in this time to stand against the wickedness of this world. May we stand as lights for Jesus Christ in each and every moment. Lord, whether it be in our homes, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our communities. Lord, when people see us, may they see Jesus and how we speak and how we act and how we love. Lord, may we be a reflection of you in all things. And Lord, may you use us in this world to continue to shine brightly, to continue to advance your kingdom. In particular, Lord, we pray here for this church. Lord, I thank you for these people that are here today. I thank you for the people that have continuously come and ministered to one another throughout the course of these years. And Lord, may you continue to bless this church. May you continue to build and grow this church. Not simply just to get numbers in the pews and money in the plate, but Lord, that we would grow closer to one another, closer to you. And Lord, that you would use us 
to impact this community for you. Lord, that you would help us to love those around us, to care for those around us, to show Jesus to those around us. Lord, may it be our mission here at this church to live for you, to do all we do for you. And Lord, help us here this morning to see how we can do that in our own lives. You've gifted us in many different ways with many different talents. Lord, may you show us how we in our lives can use what you have given us for you and for your glory. Lord, may you build up your church today. And may you use us and bless us and encourage us then to go out into this community and live our lives in honoring you. And Lord, we come here today with many other things upon our hearts. And Lord, now we take a moment to offer all of them to you in a moment of silent prayer. Now, Lord, we don't know what to pray. We can always pray the prayer you taught your disciples praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Again, we come this morning and confess the God that we believe in. So, Christians, I ask you, in whom do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. And sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Remain standing. We'll continue to sing number 135, Fairest Lord Jesus.
shines pure than all the angels have can boast. Beautiful Savior, Lord of the nations, Son of God and Son Maybe seated. Is children come forward for children's message? I invite everybody else to uh, continue on. We'll be looking at Daniel chapter 6, uh, picking up in uh, verse number 16. And 
I'm pretty sure the majority of us here know this story well. As Mia already said, she knows what happens in that story. Good job, Mom. <laughs> but it's probably a story that we've all heard since we were kids. But although we know the story, it's still important for us to continue to look at it and see how it applies to us as children and as adults even today. So before we, we see the rest of the story here, let's go to the Lord with prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you again today and we thank you. We thank you that you are a mighty God and a God who has given us his word to show us just how wonderful and powerful you are. And Lord, as we come to this well-known story here this morning, we pray that you would work in us here today. Open our hearts, open our minds to see the truth of it, not only in what has already happened, but to see how this applies to us here today, to see how you and all your power and your glory affect our own lives now. Lord, may you be with us, equipping us, convicting us, encouraging us, and showing us your might and your wonder. Lord, may you be with me in spite of my brokenness. Lord, may you use my words by your spirit to touch these people, to encourage these people, and to show these people Jesus. Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Continuing on in Daniel chapter 6, starting at verse number 16. Here again now God's word. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Then at break of day the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. The grass withers, the flower fades, the word of the Lord endures forever. Amen. I have waited a long time for this morning because this is my favorite Bible story. It's been my favorite since I was a kid. And it's the reason, as I said with the children a few minutes ago, that if you ask me my favorite animal, I'll tell you it's a lion. And I think for all of us, if we hear the word Daniel in the Bible, what comes to our mind first is probably this story. If you, somebody said the book of Daniel, what's in there? Daniel and the lion's den, right? Have you ever thought about why that is? Why, why do we come to this first? Now, for some of us, it might be because there are animals in it. For others of us, it might be because here is a story where the good guy wins in the end and the bad guys get what they deserve. You know, you know it could be for many reasons. Yours differing from mine. But I think part of why I personally like this story, might, you might agree with, is because I can put myself in Daniel's shoes. And so can you. Now, we might not be facing down lions, but if you really think about it, here you are, a Christian living in a seemingly foreign world here today. That's very foreign when it comes to God. And you're facing a situation where following God has consequences. And you find yourself wondering, what am I to do? Even Daniel's original audience could relate to this. What am I going to do now? You see, for them, so far, they have been exiled into Babylon. But God had taken care of them so far. But now there was a new empire in charge, the Persian Empire. 
And so many of them are probably wondering, well, is God going to continue to take care of us now? Yes, he took care of us during the Babylonians, but these Persians defeated the Babylonians. So is God going to continue to provide and protect us even now under this new regime? And as we see the answer here in the book of Daniel, Daniel writes and tells us this, this account to show us that, yes, he will. God will continue to preserve his people, whether it be Daniel, the exiles, or all of us today. I think that's why then when you read this story, you can't help but be encouraged, whether you're hearing it for the first time or the 500th time. Because no matter how dire or difficult your situation might be, it reminds all of us here that we have a mighty God who is going to faithfully care for us and preserve us. See, we can all relate to this story of Daniel and the lion's den because it mirrors our lives as believers here today. And so as we go through this passage, what I want you to do is to put yourself in Daniel's shoes to see just how it applies to us. And we'll do that by looking at three different things. First, looking at the schemes of man, then the steadfastness of Daniel, and finally, the salvation of God. And so the first way that this can relate to us here as we begin is the schemes of man. Now, if you know the story, you know that there are bad guys. There are villains here. These satraps or governors, high officials in the land. And these people don't like Daniel. They, they hate Daniel. And so the story goes, they are scheming to get rid of Daniel. But why is that? Well, there's a jealousy factor here. You see, whenever the Medes and the Persians took over, Belshazzar is gone, and King Darius is now put in charge. And so what he does is he appoints 150 satraps, or governors, over the whole kingdom. And then over those 120, he promotes three high officials. Now, if you remember, Daniel was made third in the kingdom under Belshazzar, and so he's probably also left an impression on Darius. So not only were Darius has made him one of these three high officials, but we come to find out, as verse 3 tells us, after paying attention to Daniel, then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. You see, first, there's a miracle here. You have an honest politician. And Daniel here shows that he is indeed trustworthy to King Darius. He has devoted his life to God, and it shows forth in his actions, in his life. And so Darius appoints Daniel because he wants to make sure that there's no financial problems going on in the kingdom, no loss, as verse 2 tells us. And so he knows that with Daniel in charge, well, everything's going to go well. The books are going to be correct. There's going to be no fraud. There's going to be no skimming money off the top. Everything's going to go well. But not everybody is happy about that. If you look at verse number 4. We're told then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. They want to get rid of him. Now, there's probably also a little bit of a racism here. You see them referring to Daniel as, as a Jew. Uh, so there's probably some, some hatred there, along with this now jealousy that Daniel is the top dog. And so what they do is they're going to sit and try to find a way that Daniel... Messes up. If we can just find a way that Daniel has maybe misplaced the books or, or done something wrong, we can come to Darius and say, hey, look, Daniel, no, nah, he, he's not qualified for this job. Look what he did. But it turns out, as verse 4 continues to tell us here, that they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. They can't find any fault. Daniel's not stealing money. Everything lines up like it should. See, with the wisdom God has given Daniel, Daniel has done so well they can't find a single problem or complaint to bring before Darius. And so what they end up concluding then is there's another way to get at Daniel. They know Daniel faithfully follows God, and that is the angle. If they can just find a way to pit Daniel and his God versus the king, then Daniel will fall. And so what they do is they come to Darius with a decree, a decree that they have written with smiles on their faces like many crooked politicians do. And they come to Darius in verse 6 and say, O king, Darius, live forever. 
All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors, the governors, are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. They come to Darius and they tell him, look, we've come up with this, this new decree. All of us have been involved, every single person, obviously, that's alive because Daniel was not involved in this. But they come to him with this decree and say, look, this is, this is a great opportunity. This is, you could sign this and this would help unite our empire because now everybody would see you as a mediator between them and the gods. It would create respect for you. It would reestablish the kingdom's monarchy. and Everything's changed now that people will get back in line. It will show that you are in charge. Not to mention, you see them kind of stroking Darius's ego this entire time. And so not thinking anything of it, Darius signs it. Their scheme has worked. They are one step closer to getting rid of Daniel, this person they hated so much. And as we read that, we feel bad for Daniel, don't we? You hear, here he is just being faithful to God and just trying to do what's right. He doesn't deserve this. These people shouldn't have hated him. The truth is, is that this should not surprise us. Because if you look at history, if you look at the truth of the scriptures, you will see that there is always going to be a rift between the people of God and the people of this world. As the early church father Augustine back in the 5th century wrote, all of human history is a conflict between two cities. The city of man, the earthly city, and the city of God. The earthly city are those people that have immersed themselves into the things of this world, the pleasures and the sin. While on the other side, the city of God are those that have foregone those pleasures, put them aside to dedicate themselves to God and His truth. And because of that, you're going to have friction between these two cities. So much that this earthly city is going to hate the city of God with all of who they are. And we see that quite clearly here with the hatred that these people have for Daniel. And so they're going to do all they can to tear him down. And the same thing can be said of the world we live in today that has not changed. The world and the people of the world do not like the people of God. Because there's just something about Christians that are trying to live a holy life, a life that's good, that just drives them crazy. They just can't sit right with them. I mean, if you think about it, the whole term goody two-shoes, right? I mean, even, even as children, a goody two-shoes is somebody that tries to do everything right. And we look at it as if it's a bad thing to try to do everything right. Oh, they're just a goody two-shoes in a way of mocking them, making fun of them. And so when we try to be like Daniel here, trying to just be faithful to God, living a life that's contrary to the life of this world, trying to follow Him and His truth, it should not surprise us when we, they look at us differently and they treat us differently. I mean, Jesus himself tells us in John 15 that just as the world hated him, we as his people, they're going to hate us too. Now, it might not be them trying to throw you into a den of lions. But, you know, if you're in school, it might come to people not liking you or making fun of you because you do the right thing or because you tell the teacher when somebody's bullying someone or when you, somebody's caught cheating. You know, in the workplace, there could be difficulty and conflict because somebody's slacking, stealing, saying anything inappropriate, and so you call them out on it. Or it could just simply be living as a Christian in this world, people regarding you as strange. Because you have different beliefs than the majority of others. There's an interesting thing about Christians back in the days of, Roman, of Rome. They thought that Christians were cannibals because here they are partaking of the Lord's body and blood which we know quite clearly this is not the case. But people will look at you differently for what you believe. And that's hard, isn't it? Because all we're trying to do is follow God. All we're trying to do is be faithful, just like Daniel here, but just like it causes these men to plot and to scheme, let's remind us when the same thing happens to you in your life, whatever that looks like, it shouldn't come as a surprise. There is a friction there between the people of God and the people of this world. But the question now becomes then, when you're faced with that, how do you respond? What do you do? And so the second thing we see is after we see the schemes of man, we now see the steadfastness of Daniel. What's Daniel going to do? Well, and we see that starting in verses 10 through verse 16. 
Well, Daniel finds out about the decree, but we're told he continues to pray. These schemers then, they catch Daniel in the act, and then they go back to Darius. But before they even mention Daniel, if you look at verse number 12, they say, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? And then Darius says that things stands fast. According to the law, the Medes and the Persians can't be revoked. Yes, I did make that decree. Yes, I did do that. It can't be changed. Well, now they've got him. So they spring the trap in verse number 13, and they come and they start to tell on Daniel, and they're slandering Daniel in the process. First, they say Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, he's not like us. He doesn't pay attention to you, O king. He's not listening to you. Or the injunction you sign, he's breaking your law. But and he doesn't only do this one time a day, but he does it three times a day. And then when they do that, the king realizes that he has been tricked. And we're told that he tries to find any kind of loophole possible. But if you remember, these people are the ones that wrote the decree. And so there is no loophole to be found. And because of that, the king is helpless to save his best man, Daniel. And Daniel is cast into the den of lions. Now when you and I read that, what Daniel does here, I think there's a temptation for us to say, well, Daniel, you could have avoided all that. We have a, a practical or pragmatic approach. Saying, Daniel, look, you didn't have to pray in public. You could have still prayed in private. Nobody would have caught you then. Or, you know, Daniel, it's just 30 days. You don't have to pray for 30 days. Technically, you're not sinning. You're not praying to any other God. What's 30 days? It's not a big deal. And I think that's the temptation that we also face in the world today is the practical, the realistic side of things. Get with the program. As you think about it, you might have had this temptation. Oh, there's some have told you this. Well, you know, people don't like to hear that they're sinners, so don't, don't say anything about sin. Or, you know, there's a lot of friction between the Bible and the culture I live in. Why not just blend them together and life's going to be easy? Or, you know... The Bible was written thousands of years ago. It doesn't apply to now. We need, we need to get with the times. We need to live you know, in a way that we live now, not by this archaic book. And so we think, well, you know, it just really doesn't apply. Or even maybe even in your own heart when it comes to your sin, the temptation that you face. You know, it's just one little sin. Everybody doing it. Or, you know, everybody has that one sin that they struggle with. I'm allowed to have mine, right? Everybody's got their vice. I can have mine. You know, I do, I do good in all these other situations. You know, I could fall short in this one. We try to be practical, realistic with it. You know, we're not perfect people. We can't be perfect people. But if you look at what we see with Daniel here, that shouldn't be the case for us as believers at all. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to remain steadfast in all of life. In our faith, no matter what the situation or the circumstance might be. I mean, if you look at Daniel, that's what he does. There's one commentator that said, you know, the story is called Daniel in the Lion's Den, but really the real Lion's Den is right here in his room, where he's going to have to wrestle with what he's going to do about this decree. Is he going to continue to do what he does, or is he going to give in? The question becomes is he going to follow the first commandment and put God above all else and continue to follow God no matter what else might happen? And we see what his choice is here in verse number 10. It says, When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he knew what it was. He went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Daniel kept doing what he always did. Now, he wasn't ignorant of the decree, not knowing, oh, I didn't know that was the case, and then getting in trouble. No, he knew what was going to happen, but he continued on doing it anyway. I noticed something here. Daniel, knowing about the decree, he doesn't have the attitude, I'm going to show them, and he goes out into the street and starts praying really, really loud for everybody to hear in defiance. I think sometimes as Christians, place of the world, <clears throat> that might be our reaction to be loud and proud about things. Or think maybe that's something that we would do if we were in the situation. Or maybe if we were in the situation, we might panic. What am I going to do next? But notice Daniel doesn't do that either. He carries on like normal. 
unshaken, unmoved, and unchanged. Steadfast in his faith. And that's the steadfast faith that you and I are called to have as believers. Because if the president came on TV today, and said that starting tomorrow, Christianity is going to be outlawed. Anybody caught worshiping God is going to be executed. What would you do? Well, I'll tell you what I do. I say, see you next Sunday. Same time, same place. Because our commitment to the Lord is a lifelong one. That's what Daniel shows us here. It doesn't matter what decree the king or the president or anybody else might give. It's to him, period. And sadly, so many people don't commit to the Lord like they should. You know, we follow him when it's easy, but when life gets hard, when following the Lord is really going to cost us, whether that be our job, whether that be our reputation, whether that be our relationship, our friends, whether it's having to give up that sin that you love so much, when it really costs us, we say, well, adios. I'll see you whenever everything gets easier again. But she, again, Daniel understands that our relationship with God isn't casual. It's for life. You think about marriage vows. Those of you that have been married, those of you that have seen weddings and the vows that are given, you vow to love your spouse in all of it. For richer, but also for poor. In health, but also in sickness. For better and also for worse. Imagine if the moment that you got really sick or the moment that you lost your job or life just got hard, your spouse packed their bags and left. Now, if some of you are looking at your spouse and you say, don't you dare do that. But we don't do that, right? Because we made a vow to that person for life. And the same is true with us and God. When you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are committing to him for life and beyond. And we're to be steadfast in that commitment to him, just like Daniel does here. So no matter what the law might say, what our neighbor might say, what society, whoever it is might say, even our own hearts, what they might say, we continue to serve God, love God, and faithfully spend time in prayer with God like Daniel does, no matter what everybody else is doing. And I think that's hard sometimes. It's when you look at yourself as a Christian in this world, it, again, it feels like we're swimming against the tide. We're trying to swim upstream. Everybody else is coming down the other. But there's an encouragement in this. Just as you commit your life, somebody else commits their life to you. If you think about when you make a vow to your spouse, you make those vows to them, but they also make the vows to you as well. And when we vow and commit ourselves to God, He does the same for us. And we see that here with Daniel. The last thing we see after man's schemes, Daniel's steadfastness, we finally see God's faithfulness in God's salvation. Here you have Daniel, he is cast into the lion's den. And Darius calls out, may your God whom you serve continually deliver you. And that stone is rolled over the entrance, it's sealed, and Darius goes home. He can't sleep, he tosses and turns all night. As soon as the sun comes up the next morning, he races back to the den. And he calls out in verse number 20. O oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lion's? See, this is the moment, if you're, we're watching this on a movie or a TV show, this is the climax. What's going to happen next? Darius is expecting to hear the lions crunching on bones and licking their lips. But we actually find out here, verses 21 and 22. Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. No harm at all has come to Daniel. And it's kind of reminiscent of back of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember when they're taken out of the furnace, they come out, they don't even smell like smoke. When Daniel was taken out of those lions, and he doesn't even have a scratch. And the reason for that is not simply that the lions weren't hungry because they had eaten a bunch of people the day before. It wasn't because Daniel was the lion whisperer and got them to just calm down. It was because of the Lord. Because God had seen that Daniel was blameless. Not that Daniel was perfect, but that he was fully devoted to him. That he was innocent in this. And so God miraculously sends his angel to shut those lions' mouths. And so after Daniel was brought out, those men who plotted to kill him and their families are all thrown into the den. And before they even hit the floor, the lions crush all their bones. 
And if you're sitting here and reading this, you, we are reminded yet again that we have a God who is going to take care of his people. As he has done up to this point with the Empire of Babylon, now with the Persians, he is still the sovereign God who controls all things, including the mouths of lions. And he is still the God who will never forsake his people. And after this, Daniel records Darius' words to, the, to the, the world in verses 26 and 27. He says, I make a decree and that in all my royal dominion people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. And then after that, in verse number 28, we're told here, So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Verse 28, we see Daniel is still standing in the end. As he writes this, why do you think Daniel leaves us with that verse at the very end of this? To remind all of us that our God will deliver and rescue his people and they will stand in the end. Now, we see with Daniel, no harm befell him because he trusted in God. And the same is true for us. Now, that might, not, that might mean that we still have to deal with problems. Although Daniel wasn't harmed by the lions, it doesn't mean that you and I won't have to deal with actual hardship or physical pain in this life. Because we are reminded here that God's purpose is not to save Daniel from trials, to keep him from anything bad happening to him. God's purpose was to save Daniel through trials. And just as Daniel had experienced his God being faithful to him in chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, he knew that his God would be faithful to him here in chapter 6. And so he could stand in faith, even in the face of hungry lions. And that is the same hope that we have here today as believers. We're going to have many trials in this life. Right now you might be going through some yourself. The world is going to hate you. The devil is going to try to ensnare you. But in the end, God will save and preserve his people. Period. Because if you look at verse 27 again, it reminds us of Christ and us. Here we see, he delivers and rescues. Jesus Christ comes into this world to deliver us, to rescue us from our sin. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He comes down out of heaven, being fully God, but taking on human flesh, being made fully man, to live perfectly in this life where we could not. What a miracle that would be to live perfectly. We could not, but Jesus did. But not only that, he went all the way to that cross. So by dying on that cross, by that great miracle of his salvation, if you have put your trust in him, you have been washed white as snow. You have been forgiven and set free from your sin. He who has saved us from the power of sin, the devil, and death. We can see ourselves in this picture. Because if you have put your trust in Jesus Christ, you have experienced the salvation of the Almighty God. And nothing can ever take that away. See, that's why that wonderful passage in Romans chapter 8 tells us, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the deliverance. That's the salvation. That's the hope we have in this mighty God. Because Jesus Christ, just like Daniel, was innocent and yet condemned to death because of his faithfulness to the Lord. And whereas Daniel survived, Jesus didn't. Jesus actually died. But as we know, as we'll celebrate again in a couple weeks, he didn't stay there. He rose again. And by his death and by his resurrection. He has given to us as his people a salvation and a hope that can never be taken away. Whereas the world and all of its schemes will be broken like the bones of these men by these lions. We are reminded here that you and I will come out in the end without a scratch. Not because of who we are, but because of our mighty God. Who has saved us, has delivered us, and will continue to hold us in the palm of his hands. And that is the wonderful thing that this story of the Daniel and the Lions then shows us. 
that you and I, we can relate to Daniel because the same mighty God that is with Daniel is the same mighty God that is with us today. A mighty God that nothing can stop him. Nothing can take us away from him. A mighty God, as we'll sing about in just a moment in our final hymn. I, I chose the final hymn this morning, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, because it reminds us of the truths here. That hymn's written by the reformer Martin Luther. So he's sitting there reflecting on Psalm number 46, and he writes that praising God and reminding us just how great our God is. Again, showing us the same truths here this morning. That even if the earth gives way, that even if the mountains are thrown into the sea, that even if the waters roar and foam with chaos, our God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. The same present help we see here in the book of Daniel. And it's worthy, worth to note that Daniel himself probably knew the words of that psalm. As he's standing there facing those lions and knowing that his God was a refuge and a strength and a very present help. And that proved true for him then. And if you've put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then it's going to prove true for you as well. Because you have a mighty God. It's the same God here that stands above the schemes of all men. A God who will care for his people and preserve them in the end. And because we have a God like this, this encourages us to live a life like Daniel. That when the time comes when you feel like you are about to be thrown into the lion's den, you can remember what has happened here. And you can remember what has happened in the Lord Jesus Christ. And know that you have a God that has already delivered you. And a God that will deliver you in the end. And if that is the case, then wherever we might be in this life, whatever the den of lions it might be we're about to be thrown into, we can have the same steadfast, consistent faith that we see here with Daniel. Because we have the same steadfast, consistent God that delivered him who has delivered us. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we are humbled here this morning. For we are reminded of how mighty a God that you are. A God that has delivered his people, that continues to care for his people, no matter what the world might try to do. Lord, as we are reminded by this well-known story, Lord, you saved Daniel in spite of all the odds that were against him. And Lord, the same is true for us. Whenever we feel like we are broken and beaten and the world is winning, we are reminded of the hope that we have in Christ. That you have saved us, you have secured us, we are in your hands and nothing can take that away. So Lord, may you help us then to stand against the schemes of this world. Help us to have the steadfast faith that Daniel has living for you no matter the, what the consequence might be. May we be found as those that are consistent each and every day, committed to you in all of life. Lord, that when people see us, they quite clearly, just as they would see a wedding ring on our finger, they would see you in us. And so, Lord, may you help us this week to remain steadfast in our faith. Lord, when we are facing the troubles and the pains of this life, remind us the hope that we have in you, that as hard and difficult as it might be, you have delivered us, you have saved us, and nothing can ever take us away from you. So encourage us today. Equip us today. And we thank you again that you are our mighty God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If I have to stand, our final hymn this morning is number 91. A mighty fortress is our God. side.
Just a quick reminder, we'll have our fellowship lunch and following worship. Please, everyone join us, whether you brought something or not. And receive now the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. The peace.